Hello and welcome to the Clinical Liver Disease video series. CLD is an official digital learning publication of the AASLD. My name is Vinay Sundaram and I'm a transplant hepatologist at Cedar sinai Medical Center. And I'm also the guest associate editor of CLD. I'm here with Dr. Zoe Memel, who is a resident in internal medicine at uh, Massachusetts General Hospital and author of a review article regarding intermittent fasting and its role in the treatment of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Zoe, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. So your article was really interesting and I thought it provided a really nice, um, concise overview of the role of intermittent fasting in treating our patients with fatty liver disease. And I was wondering, uh, why did you initially become interested in studying intermittent fasting um, as a proposed treatment for patients with fatty liver disease? Yeah, so it's a, it's a good question. So my background is primarily in nutrition. And when I was doing my undergrad degree in nutrition, that's when I first kind of discovered or was hearing buzzwords about intermittent fasting. And intermittent fasting really stems, I think it was first studied in the 90s when researchers discovered that rats, a lot of them, the way that they were fed, they were fed once a day, they ate for about three hours, it was often high fat, and then they would fast the rest of the day. And they realized that this was a really nice model to kind of investigate dietary patterns and that animals, particularly rats that were eating only once a day tended to have decreased insulin resistance, improved stress markers, and oftentimes reduced adiposity. And I thought that it was always kind of interesting. And then in, in medical school, I went to USC where there's a prominent aging researcher who started to kind of associate fasting with longevity and was seeing these associations with decreased telomere shortening. And again, I was just more and more interested about this theory that maybe we aren't supposed to eat more than once a day and maybe reducing glucose in the blood may actually improve um, inflammation and reduce stress and actually allow the cells to kind of grow and repair. And I got interested in intermittent fasting in, in the lens of fatty liver disease, because actually in, in February of 2020, there was an amazing review published in the New England Journal about kind of the effects of intermittent fasting. And they, they talked about how there's quite impressive evidence now that it improves insulin resistance and adiposity and obesity. And I was thinking, well, if all of these kind of benefits are occurring, these are also the things that cause fatty liver to get worse and started to dive into the literature and, and saw that there are a couple studies out, the most recent one, the, the earliest one that I could find in fatty liver in particular was in 2017, um, predominantly in Ramadan populations, looking at time-restrictive intermittent fasting, but there really aren't any studies that correlate this with biopsy or MR spectroscopy. And I was really interested in investigating this further. Yeah, that's great. And in fact, I remember reading that New England Journal of Medicine article, and it um, and it appeared that uh, the um, the benefits go beyond obesity-related complications. They even found um, they proposed evidence with regards to intermittent fasting helping in regards to osteoarthritis and multiple sclerosis and even cancer prevention. So, I agree with you. There are a lot of potential health benefits in relation to intermittent fasting. Now, I was wondering, though, that said, um, if we start to re recommend this treatment to our patients, are there any risks that we should counsel them on? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And a, a, one that comes up with patients that I start to just kind of suggest this to a lot in the clinical setting, most studies, including in rats, have not been done in, in patients with diabetes or patients on um, hypoglycemic agents, although they're starting to do studies not on patients on insulin, but patients who are on things like metformin, and they really haven't found side effects. I think really the most common side effects are irritability, hunger. Some people do get headaches or migraines associated with hypoglycemia, but almost all of these side effects resolve over a couple couple of days once your body gets used to it. Yeah, that's great. And um, I'll tell you from my own personal experience, because I'm a, not only am I a believer in it for my patients, I actually do it personally. And you are correct that um, in the beginning, you do have those side effects of hunger, um, and that can lead to some of the symptoms you described of irritability, uh, headaches, etc. But yeah, in my own personal experience, over within a week's period of time, it did seem to resolve. You know, during that time when we advocate for intermittent fasting, um, during the fasting period, what can the patient um, consume? Can they consume water? Can they consume coffee? What would you suggest during the fasting period? 
Yeah, so it's a great question. And I what I like to explain to the patient to kind of help them understand what they can and cannot eat is that the theory is, is that the glycogen, which is where all of your glucose, your temporary glucose is stored, is in your liver and your muscle. And after about 14 hours, you lose all of your liver glucose or glycogen. And you start to have to break down the fat in your visceral adipose tissue into triglycerides and free fatty acids. So in order to keep this, what we call ketosis process going, you have to avoid carbohydrates because once your body sees carbohydrates, it will release insulin and it will kind of break the cycle. So you can have water, you can have bubbly water, you can have coffee. You just really don't want to avoid carbohydrates or, or protein or fat. I think the controversial thing that we don't have enough evidence for is artificial sweeteners. And if you can have an artificial sweetener, I think we really just don't know. There isn't enough data. I think if a patient wants to try this, but can't give up their, you know, Splenda in the morning, I think that the benefits probably outweigh uh, the risks of ruining fasting that they could probably pursue that. Yeah, that's great. You were touching upon the mechanisms with regards to um, breakdown of visceral adiposity. And yeah. um, do you believe that the primary benefit is related to weight loss? Or do you think there's an additional mechanism by which fasting can provide uh, benefit um, in uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? So I think that is the question that everyone is trying to figure out. Um, there haven't been that many high quality studies in humans. This has been investigated quite a bit in rats. One example, there's a lot of great research coming out of the University of San Diego, showing that rats fed a high fat diet, both just at their normal consumption and then time restricted. So only allowed one kind of particular time of day, the ones, even the same amount of calories for both control, both groups, the ones that had a time restriction had much better benefits for insulin resistance and waist circumference. And then they've done other studies where they, they did a study where they had women and they gave them one group had a 25 reduction in their calories. And the other group had the same reduction in calories, but was told they could only eat it during a certain time period. And the group that could only eat it in a certain time period also had more improved insulin resistance and adiposity. So I, I really do think that there is something with the ketosis that's produced. And I think that's because ketones are not only an energy source, but I think that they kind of produce this very strong cellular cascade that we're really only starting to understand and how that improves insulin resistance and maybe reduces triglyceride adiposity and reduces fibrosis in the liver is something that is going to take a little bit of time to further understand. Hey, thank you very much. Well, the question I want to get at, though, is that um, I am a believer in intermittent fasting, as I've mentioned. I personally do the 16-8 uh, fast, but there's a variety of ways in which you can um, incorporate intermittent fasting. Online, you can read about, um, for instance, fasting for two days for two 24-hour periods. Yeah. And there's even some, um, some even uh, more, I guess, extreme versions of that, which I've had patients tell me about. For instance, they go on month-long fasts where they have nothing but water and certain liquid foods, but they really are not eating solids. Now, are there any uh, modalities which you say are better than others? And furthermore, upon that, are there any modalities of fasting which you would not recommend to patients? Yeah, so I think what you're getting at is that there's many different types of fasting, as you just noted. There's time restrictive, the most popular, the one that you practice, I also practice that as well. There's something called five to two, which I think you also reference, which is where you, you can fast for two days out of the week and then eat normally for five days. And then there's very long alternate fasts where you can go numerous days. And there are a couple studies that have been published both for the general population and for the fatty liver population, one was published in 2019, and it looked at a modified altered caloric restriction. So one group just ate less calories per day. Another group just um, skipped, they fasted for one day, then they didn't fast. And then another group did time-restricted fasting. And they did find that the group that fasted the longest period had a slightly reduced body composition of fat at the end of the month long period. But in regards to shear wave elastography, which is a method that you can look at for the liver to determine the amount of stiffness, they didn't find a significant difference between any of the fasting modalities, which is kind of interesting and kind of goes against the hypothesis that prolonged fasting may have a better benefit. So I think that that needs to be further fleshed out, maybe with a little bit higher quality studies for a longer period of time. Um, I think it would make sense that if you're fasting for a longer period, you'd be able to kind of have a more benefit to the liver because you can further reduce lipogenesis and increase lipolysis. But I think that that needs to be further understood. And are there any fasts which you would not recommend to a patient, which you think may be too dangerous or have the potential for harm? 
I think that fasting for an extended amount of time, if you're not being supervised for a physician, is probably dangerous just because I, I, ketosis is not what we're supposed to be in for extended periods of time. You can start to get kidney stones, you can get acidosis, you can get altered mental status. So I would not recommend probably more than two days of fasting unless you're doing it under the supervision of a physician. Okay, thank you. That's great. And then finally, to kind of bring this home to the patients, which is ultimately who we work for. Uh, we talked a lot about science, but... Um, how would you kind of explain this to a patient and how would you counsel them to try to get them to incorporate intermittent fasting into their lifestyle? Yeah, so I think the most important thing is kind of first just gauging the patient. Are they the type of patient who is really interested in first trying to change foods and, and read food labels and cook more? Are they a type of patient who may be overwhelmed by all of that and wants maybe an easier alternative and would be receptive to trying to fast? But the way I describe it is that research is showing that there may be some benefit from an extended period of time without food. And during this kind of period of rest, your cells are able to regrow and repair and maybe reduce oxidation. And what we could do if you're interested is I don't ever recommend that someone just suddenly start intermittent fasting. I, can, I feel like it's very difficult for people to do this. So what I first do is I kind of do a quick 24 hour dietary recall and kind of understand their dietary habits. Are they the type of person who binge eats once a day? It may be a little bit easier for them if they don't eat throughout the day. If they eat snacks the whole day, it may be a little bit harder. And if they're the type of person who is snacking all day, the first kind of goal that I have with them is let's reduce your snacks and just have meals. Once we've gone you to three meals a day, then I say, okay, now let's try to create a time period where you're not eating. Let's say it's you don't need anything for five hours. Now let's extend that to six hours. Now that, let's extend that to seven hours. Do you think you could maybe skip breakfast and we could see how this goes for a week and then slowly build a person to a 16, eight kind of intermittent fast if that's what they're amenable to. Some people work 24 hour shifts and are like, you know, it would actually be easier for me to just not eat for a full day and then eat normally the next day. So I think it, you really have to consider what is their lifestyle? What is their work? And kind of what is their preference? But it's always doable. I think you just have to gradually go into it. Okay, that's great. Um, so thank you again, uh, Dr. Zoe Membel, for your time and for your expertise. This was very interesting. And thank you for allowing us to expand our clinical liver disease video series. And to our audience, thank you for joining us. On behalf of all of us on the CLD team, I hope you found this um, video useful and insightful. For more information, please visit us at www.cldlearning.com. Thanks again for watching. Thank you.